Would you look with me in Isaiah chapter 6? <clears throat> this is the Word of God. It's the truth. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And one would call out to the other and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then I said, Here I am, here I am. send me. And he said, Go. The grass withers, the flower fades, God's word abides forever. By his grace and mercy, may his word be preached for you. Please be seated. <clears throat> And there was a man. His name was Handel. In the 18th century, specifically 1741, that man, being given the assignment and embracing the compilation of passages of Scripture from Psalms, Revelation, but predominantly from Isaiah, all rooted in one key passage that is before us today in Isaiah 7, 14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. It is that passage that became the basis of what we now know as the Messiah. The composition of Handel that was done in 1741, and by the way, on that Christmas festival, I'll just go ahead and tell you, the first half will be the classics and contemporary and classical sing, uh, things that we love at Christmas and things that you will enjoy, but the last half with drama, orchestra, and choir, and solos, and instrumentalists, and vocalists, will be that selections from Handel's Messiah, which are rooted mostly from the prophecy of Isaiah, specifically rooted in the regal prophecy of a king being brought forth through a virgin, and that king being Emmanuel. It is that that we will have the opportunity to celebrate. It is that that motivated me this year to give you Christmas according to Isaiah in our four Advent studies. The Christmas according to Isaiah. What would Isaiah have you to know about Christmas? Much of what he wrote, you will be hearing throughout this season. You, are, you know there are dozens of prophecies in the Old Testament and signs and types and symbols pointing to the Christ. It is absolutely astounding how many of them come from the book of Isaiah, specifically the ones that we look at this morning this one in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. But you can't read that without understanding Isaiah. And you can't understand Isaiah's deliverance of that promise until you understand that prophetic promise given by the, uh, by the prophet in the promised land. The prophetic promise in the promised land came at a time that was very much lacking in promise. And it is that backdrop that is of crucial understanding of what Isaiah 
would have you. Now, normally we go there, we quote the prophecy, we rejoice, it's fulfilled in Christ, and we go right on. But how many times do we understand the setting of that prophecy in Isaiah? There was a man named Handel. There was a man, another man, 2,000 years ago. A man who was a descendant of a long forgotten line of kings. A man who was a descendant of a long forgotten line of kings, now dispossessed of their kingdom. Now by divine fiat, having been removed from their kingdoms and their kingdoms eradicated. And that kingdom that was eradicated and those kings that had been dispossessed was of the tribe of Judah, the line of David, and the man was Joseph. He is the one who stands in the line, the long-forgotten line, and here he is, Joseph, carpenter, stonemason, small village on the side of the mountains in the district of Galilee. It is there that he is now betrothed, and he is betrothed to one who also is from that long-forgotten line of kings, the line of David from the tribe of Judah. He is betrothed to her, and news has arrived to him that she, who has taken the vows of purity and chastity in the, in the, in the ceremonial commitment to marriage called betrothal, now awaiting the ceremony of covenant and then the consummation she now it becomes aware and we don't know how he got the news but he got the news she's with child this man who was of the line of david now reduced to the vocation of a carpenter no kingdom no throne no kingdom to be enthroned upon the kingdoms long obliterated of the 12 tribes This now, this one who is there gets the news. But unlike many of his predecessors, the Bible tells us in Matthew he's a righteous man. But he's not only a righteous man, he's a compassionate man. As a righteous man, he knows what he must do. He must bring her the writ of divorce. For she has violated the covenant. Clearly, if she's with child, then clearly... She has violated the covenant, and immorality has now entered into their covenant relationship and the covenant broken. But he's a compassionate man, a gracious man. So he decides, I will not do this publicly. I will do it privately. But his plan is stopped because the man receives a messenger from the throne of God. And that messenger has been sent And when the angel arrives, the angel informs him that what he supposes is not accurate, that the one to whom you are betrothed is a virgin, that in fact she has been chosen and appointed by God to fulfill a prophecy, a long-forgotten prophecy, like the long-forgotten line of David, a long-forgotten prophecy that we find find in the in the um, many times neglected prophet Isaiah. And there he quotes from Isaiah. The angel says, she is with child, but this is the fulfillment. You are to call this one Jesus, but let me tell you who this one is. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy. And the virgin shall conceive. And the miracle is not a virgin birth, but that a virgin gives birth by the miracle of a virgin conception. The virgin shall bring forth regal language. We sing, bring forth the royal diadem. This is regal language indicating the virgin is bringing forth the king. You will call him Jesus. He will be called Emmanuel. 
God with us, God one of us, God for us, God among us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And the man Joseph hears the prophecy 2,000 years ago. And there was a man 800 years before Joseph, 2,800 years ago from when you hear this sermon, 800 years before Joseph, this man's father's name was Amos. This man was a prophet called of God. This man prophesied in Jerusalem to the kingdom of Judah, which was made up of the two tribes that had remained faithful to the royal line of David and had the end the, as king those who were of the line of David and the tribe of Judah and the line of David. And that was the Benjamin and Judah tribes now called the kingdom of Judah and its capital, the very city of God, which was Jerusalem itself. And it was there that he ministered. It was there that he ministered to four sons of David who ruled in succession. He ministered to Uzziah. He ministered to Jotham. He ministered to Ahaz. And he would minister to Hezekiah. This prophet was dispossessed himself. This prophet was rejected by the kings to whom he ministered because of his continual call to their personal repentance. And he was not embraced by the people because he kept calling the people who had attempted to syncretize pagan worship with the worship of Yahweh. He kept calling them to repentance. His name was Isaiah. And Isaiah now enters into his ministry in the most formidable moments. And it is at this moment that God comes down and God peels back the clouds of heaven and he gives Isaiah a vision of the throne. It is at this moment he calls him. It is at this moment he consecrates him. It's at this moment he commissions him. And in this moment in Isaiah chapter 6, he looks into the throne room and as he looks into the throne room, he sees the preoccupation, not just the occupation, not just the occupation itself, but the absolute preoccupation in doing what we assembled to do today, and that is God-centered worship. Amen. That God would be lifted up for here, noticeably, in the year a king, Uzziah, died, the king of kings is enthroned, still enthroned, high and lifted up to rule and to reign forever. It is that king that Isaiah sees. And when he sees into the throne room the sign and symbol of glory and power, the train of the robe of that king cannot even be contained in the infinitude of this temple. It fills it to overflowing. The smoke of his presence, the Shekinah glory, fills up the temple. As the smoke of his presence and the glory of his presence fills it, and the statement of his power as the train fills it to overflowing, those that he is designed to serve him, and their primary service is not simply being messengers, but being worshipers of the living God, that they now surround that throne, and they are so designed so that the joy of their worship will be met with reverence in worship, and the joy is not shown in triviality, it's shown in reverence, and the reverence is not shown in morbidity, but overflowing joy before the Lord. And they cry out with a hymn, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is filled with His glory, and they are equipped so that they can bring appropriate worship to Him. They have been given six wings, two, to cover their eyes lest they look upon Him and perish. Two, to cover their feet lest they stand in His presence and they have no standing without Him. And then two, to say, stay suspended in the air, not only to worship but to be ready to be directed 
to go and serve him as he has so ordained. There they are designed to give him praise, and when they praise him, they have all of the attributes of God to praise him with. They could praise him for his glorious love, his marvelous grace, his patience, his mercy, his righteousness. They could praise him for all of that, but they descend not to the attributes that, that are available to them. They ascend to the one attribute that modifies every attribute, the one that declares this God is not only pure, this God is unique. There is none like him. There is none beside him. There is none above him. There is none in front of him. This God is absolutely unique, holy, 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 not just holy to the normative, not just holy to the comparative, but holy to the superlative. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Thresholds tremble. And no one has a closed hymn book. No one has a closed mouth. The hearts of the angels overflow as they call out continually to one another, holy, Holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And what happens when we see this God in all of his holiness? I am lost, says the prophet. It's not just kings and people that need to repent. I need to repent. I am lost. I am an unclean man. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. I am undone. And this holy God marries his relentless love and grace to his holiness. And from an altar which is designed for sacrifice, a burning coal from that altar is taken by a servant of God, placed upon his lips, and gospel news, good news. Your sins are forgiven. You are clean. Your sins have been atoned for. Amen. Now who will go for me to declare my holiness and my grace. And the redeemed says, here am I, send me. And the God of glory and grace says, go. His ministry will be to Uzziah, now dead. This king lives, all other kings die. And after Uzziah, he'll go to Uzziah's son, Jotham. And now we come to the moment when he begins his ministry to the grandson of Uzziah, the son of Jotham, still of the line of David. His name is Ahaz. And we find him sent by God to meet him. And a glorious promise and a dire Warning and judgment come from the lips of the prophet. Follow with me in Isaiah chapter 7. This is the back story. We've got a glorious promise in the promised land, but it's not promising times. The times are not promising at all. Look at chapter 7. In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Rezin, the king of Syria, and, uh, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but would not yet mount an attack against it. And when the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, that's another word for the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Ephraim or the kingdom of Israel, the heart of Ahaz and, when the leader falters, so do the people, the heart of Ahaz, that's the king of Judah, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. You know, just stop right there. How in the world? Ahaz, how can your, you are a son of David. 
the man who by the power of God brought down Goliath, took down the bear, took down the lion, defeated the Philistines, the man whom God used to bring his people to the glory of his name. How can you tremble before other kings? But he trembles, and when he trembles, so did the people. They're full of fear as they shake like trees before the wind. And then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Sheer Jashub, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to them, Be careful, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria and the son of Remaliah, because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go against Judah and terrify it. Let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabeel as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord God of hosts. It shall not stand. It shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. And within 65 years, Ephraim, or Israel, will be gathered, will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Remaliah. If you are not, if you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. In other words, this is what he's telling him. The word of the Lord has just come to you. Now, where did he find Ahaz? Well, Ahaz is up checking the water supply. Ahaz is, there's a siege coming. And when a siege comes and we get surrounded, you need food and you need what? Water. So he's up there checking out the water supply that he can stand against the siege. And in a sense, Isaiah says, what are you doing here? You don't need to be here. The word of the Lord has already come to you. These two nations, Israel and Syria, Israel north of you, the ten tribes that rebelled against the Lord 200 years before this, 200 years before you had the the United Kingdom, Saul, David, Solomon, then came the division of the kingdom 200 years before this, and he says that that kingdom that's there, that kingdom in 65 years will be no more. That kingdom of Syria, those kings that are over it, those kingdoms in 65 years, they are non-existent. These are two smoldering fire, fire, smoldering with fire stumps. Don't, do not quake in their presence. Do not be fearful. I have promised you. Well, Ahaz, here's this word but he doesn't leave his reconnaissance for water. So now God does something very compassionate. He offers to give him a sign to strengthen his faith. If you're fearful, you'll be destroyed. But if you're firm at faith, if your faith is firm, you'll stand. And your faith is firm only when you see the object of your faith and it's not a water supply. It's me. I'm the one that you put your trust in. And so here, he then proclaims to him that his faith is to be firm, and so to help him with his faith, God does something very unusual. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Now, this is given in the command. This isn't an invitation. This is a command. Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as the heavens. Stop right there. So God says through Isaiah. Now, when it says, now look, when it says the Lord spoke to Ahaz, what, that's referring to the fact that when God speaks in his prophets, it's not the prophets aren't speaking about God or giving you a word about God. When they speak, God's speaking. The word of the Lord came to me. That's why that phrase is used. So God, through Isaiah, is speaking to him, and he now gives him an unusual command, not just an invitation. And the command is, ask for a sign. Ask for a miracle. 
You can ask for it from the heavens. You can ask for it from the earth. You can go under the earth, above the earth. No limits. Just ask me for a sign. I'll give you a sign to strengthen your faith. Now, there's something built into that. The first thing that's built into that is that you actually live in an age and you keep turning on televisions that they keep having programs that display to you the notion that if you got strong faith, you'll ask for miracles. Actually, the asking for miracles is the absence of faith or the presence of weak faith. Gideon's fleece was not a sign of the strength of his faith. It was the sign of the weakness of his faith. But the graciousness of God is he gave him the sign. So God will give signs and wonders and miracles, sometimes for very sovereign purposes, other times to help as an evidence. But you ought not to need it. The fact that God says it ought to be enough. The word of the Lord has come. You don't need a miracle. But Ahaz is not believing. He's still full of fear. So God very graciously says, I give you no limits. I mean, you want, you want the sun to disappear? You want, just ask me for a sign. I'll give it to you. Now, that's very important, folks, because the asking for signs was forbidden because it was seen as putting the Lord to the test. Deuteronomy 6, 14, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. It's the very text that Jesus quoted to Satan in the wilderness. You shall not put the Lord of your God to the test. There are only two exceptions that I know of in the Bible. One is what you just did a few moments ago, the offering, the tithe. God says about the tithe, to call for our faithfulness, he says, test me in this and see what I will do. Malachi. Malachi tells us that God says, test him in our obedience to the tithe. And this is the only other exception I know in the Bible, where God not only invites, he commands him to ask for a sign. You see, in Deuteronomy, God says, don't test me. Why? Well, listen, what did God, where are they, Deuteronomy is what? The people are coming through the wilderness. How did they get into the wilderness? God brought them through a Red Sea. What did God do in the Red Sea? He opened it up and they walked through it. And then what did he do? He drowned the most mighty army in the world in the Red Sea. And what did he do before that? He delivered them and their firstborn did not die in the Passover, but they were delivered during the Passover while his strong hand of judgment with 10 plagues, including the death of the firstborn, even to the house of Pharaoh took place. And then, and then when they went out, God was with them with a pillar of cloud by, by day and a pillar of fire by night. And every, time they see, and every time they put into camp, they put the tabernacle in the middle and that cloud came right in front of them. And before they went in their tent, all they had to do was look. There's God coming down to be with us. And then the next morning, there's God rising up, the pillar of cloud and fire to lead us out. And all of that. And by the way, before you leave, just go outside and get a little manna. I mean, forget banana bread. I mean, you can get manna bread. And I'm sure some Southerner figured out a way to fry it. And it was there every single day. This is what God had done day after day after day. But what did the people keep doing? We want a sign. He said, it's a worthless generation that asks for the sign and the miracle. All you have to do is look at me. There I am every night. There I am every day. There's my provision. There's the water out of the rock. There's me. There's me bringing you through the Red Sea. There's me destroying your enemy. That's enough. And when I speak, you believe me high and lifted up while all the kings of this world die. But here he gives an exception. He not only asks him to ask for a sign, he commands him to ask for a sign, but Ahaz doesn't do it. Note his feigned spirituality. And he said, and, but he says, oh, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, well, now let me just stop there. That's not a statement that he, well, God, I wouldn't do that to you. What he is saying is, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test because I don't believe the Lord. What, we, what you're not told here is what you're told in other passages of Scripture. He already has another plan. His plan is, I'm going to get rid of Ephraim, and I'm going to get rid of Syria because I'm going to go above Ephraim to this great, mighty kingdom of fierce warriors with their pagan gods. And I have sent, he sent a note to the king of Assyria. Let's enter into alliance. Signed, King Ahaz, your servant. 
No, I've already decided to go into a servile relationship with the king of Syria. There is going to be my hope. My hope is in the king of Assyria. My hope is in my water supply, my walls around the city, and my hope is in the king of Assyria. So I don't need this. I, my faith in what God's word says is not affirmed. And I'm not even going to ask for the sign. I've already got my plan. That's what I plan. King Assyria is my deliverer, my, and his pagan gods that I unite my people with, and we will be his servants, and I will look to him. I will surrender to him. He is my salvation. He is my deliverer. So now what does God say? Look at the next verse. Hear then, O house of David. He's speaking to the royal line. We just went to formal language. Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows, when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land where two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the days that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, and they will come and settle into the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on all the thorn bushes and on all the pastures. In that day the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that will, they will give, he will eat curds. For everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become bones and thorns. With, ha with, ha with bow and arrows, a man will come here, for all the lands will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are, for that will be loosed and where sheep will tread. Now, what is he saying? If I can just give you the distillation of that in just a few moments I have. Here's what he is saying to them. He is saying, you will not listen to me, then I will not. My patience has now drawn to a close. God is long-suffering and patient. But there is a time he brings his patient that's designed to lead us to repentance. And when we have said no and insulted the spirit of grace and trampled under our feet the blood of his covenant, then God says this day has now been shut. House of David, it's just a matter of time I remove you. I not only will remove you, I will bring another king. And that other king will have an adopted father from your line, an appointed mother from your line, and the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child, and that child is Emmanuel. And when that child comes, as he is growing up and as he arrives, he will arrive in this place but your kingdom will be no more. The kingdom of Ephraim will be no more. Syria will be no more. They'll not only be destroyed in 65 years. When this Emmanuel comes, 800 years from now, he'll be born where there is no kingdom of Judah. There is no kingdom of Israel. There is no kingdom of Syria. There are only those that I have whistled for, the bees and the flies. I bring them from Egypt. I bring them from Assyria, and Assyria will come down. He'll, shave, he'll not only dispossess this royal line, he'll shave your beard, he'll shave your hair, he'll shave all the, in other words, he'll take your manhood from you. He'll take your line from you. He'll take everything from you. This one whom you think will deliver you will own you, him and his pagan gods. And the 10 tribes, he'll take off into captivity, and Ephraim will be no more. Then he will be conquered 
record as I whistle forth another king, and the king of Babylon will come down from that same area of Assyria, and he'll come down, and Judah will be no more. And then will come the Medo-Persians, and then will come Greece, and then will come Rome, and by the time this sign is fulfilled, I'll give you a sign, and here is the sign, the virgin shall conceive, bring forth the royal king, Emmanuel, God with us. And when he arrives, you will be dispossessed. There will be no kingdom, and the one enthroned is a pretender. His name will be Herod the Great. That's what he will see in that day. You remember all these big, rich farms? They're nothing. thousand vines down to two. thousand shekels down to nothing. Land overflowing milk and honey. You just look for some curds. Just give me the droppings. What you will live in is under my hand of disciplining judgment. Your fearfulness is here because of your faithlessness. But I tell you, 800 years from now, and like every prophecy that is long-term, there's a short-term fulfillment. And the short-term fulfillment is Ephraim is gone, Syria is gone, you'll be gone, and the one to whom you look for will become the instruments I will use to bring judgment upon you. Well, brothers and sisters, would you just allow me just a few moments to give you just, all I'm going to do is just give you the takeaways. Isaiah's Christmas takeaways, the backstory of this prophecy. We love to quote it in Matthew. Here's the background of Christmas from Isaiah. Number one, plan B. We don't have one. I don't have plan B. I got one. I'm going to preach the gospel until they put me under that. You're going to have to peel. Look, good news is it doesn't have to be Briarwood's pulpit. You're going to have to peel my hands off some pulpit to bear me. You're going to have to bury me with the pulpit, and I'm not going to stop sharing the gospel on an airplane, a train, or in a mall, or anywhere else. I only got one plan. It's called the Great Commission. I've only got one message. It's called the gospel, and I've only got one king. And I am not dependent upon the president. I am not dependent upon the Supreme Court. I am not dependent. I have no other alliances. They may want to ally, and I'll send the ambassadors to the White House. I'll send the ambassadors to the Congress. I'll send the ambassadors to the Supreme Court. I'll send them everywhere. But they're not my alliances. We don't rise and fall with the Supreme Court or a White House or a presidency or a political party. We've got a king. See him high and lifted up. It is this king, his message, his victory that he has secured at his cross that he has announced with his empty tomb. That's the only plan I've got. I don't have a water reserve plan. I don't have a walled plan. I don't have another king plan. I have no alliances. We have none of those. I call upon you. Put your confidence in only one person, and that plan is his plan, and we follow his word. And it doesn't make sense to the world. For instance, what I'm doing right now, the world calls foolishness, but I'll keep preaching. Because by the foolishness of the message preached, we're being saved. So God's plan, we will follow. And yes, I'd love for the Supreme Court to get on board with enough sense to bless a nation with the right view of marriage. But we don't have to wait for them to pass an edict or a law. We can build marriages, one man, one woman for one life, rooted in the gospel, proclaiming the gospel with its humility and its courage, with its compassion and its conviction. Those marriages, we don't wait for a Supreme Court. They can be built right in the church of Jesus Christ and sent into every single community. I don't wait for the Supreme Court to say, y'all can pray in a classroom. As long as a man of God or a woman of God walks into a classroom, walks into a building, walks anywhere, they can call upon the Lord and proclaim the Lord as long as it's King Jesus to whom they look to. And they'll do so with words and tone that that honor that King. We wait not for a Supreme Court to pass a ruling. We're not waiting not for an executive. Grateful for all of them because I love for our nation to be blessed with sensible policies. But we have no alliances. We have no plan B. We've only got one. 
And that is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that that king who came here to save us is the king that sends his spirit who indwells us. And he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Secondly, idolatry. Not only do not let idolatry put, creep into your life. And brothers and sisters, it's very easy. Even the good things that God tells us to love, like a marriage, like a spouse, like a family, like children, like anything, even the good thing, not just sinful evil things, good things can be put in front of God, above God, before God, or alongside of God. Please listen to this from this text. Isaiah wants you to know God sent Emmanuel because the idols of this world not only cannot deliver you, they usually end up devouring you. Not only did Assyria not deliver Judah, and God's covenant people. The king of Assyria ended up devouring Israel and Judah. Our idols don't deliver. They all fall and break their arms. But before they fall, they'll devour you if your trust is in them. Please pray for me that I will never put my, whatever means God's given me, I want to use. And I'll pray for you that we will enjoy all of God's good gifts, but we have only one God to worship and in whom we trust. Because the idols of this world cannot deliver, and not only do they not deliver, they end up devouring the people that put their trust in them. Thirdly, finally, faithful means fearless. When you're faithful, then you become fearless. If you're not faithful, then you become fearful. And that's where Ahaz was. Harry, should I pray for more faith? It's okay. But I'm asking you not to focus on praying for more faith. I'm asking you not so much how big is your faith, but where is your faith? with just a little faith, if it's in the right one, you can thrash down mountains. So I do pray you and I have big faith. But my bigger concern is where is my faith? Isaiah is willing to risk his life in front of Ahaz, give this word that is nonsensical to Ahaz, as Ahaz says, I got Assyria. What do you mean, a promise of a smoldering? What, what do you mean, I've got Assyria? But Isaiah gives that promise because Isaiah has seen the Lord. He has seen the Lord high and lifted up. It is that God who will deliver you. These kings die. This God is the king forever. And it is that king who left that throne to come through that virgin to go to a cross to save us and has ascended back into that throne and says to you and me, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples. There's your message. There's your plan. You've got a God who is holy, but a God who will give his own son on that altar to give that burning coal to save us from our sins, that we can have everlasting life. And He is risen, and He is within us. Folks, that's why I pray for, long, listen, the reason I long for God-centered, participatory, triune worship every Lord's Day is I want you to get a glimpse of how great your God is. And when you leave here, that God goes with you. I'm not trying to get him down to a size that you feel comfortable with him. I want you to be uncomfortable like Isaiah and that you're now totally resting on that God to make you right with him. Not you getting him down to a bite size, but him getting you to the size he wants you because he is in you. It is that God in that throne who dwells in your heart. And when that God is in your heart, Fear is banished. Whom shall I be afraid? Emmanuel, God is with us. One of us. 
among us, and he's for us. And if he be for us, who can be against us? Emmanuel, the virgin, brought forth the king. Bring forth the royal diadem, Emmanuel. And he's with you. And until you go to be with him, you are not walking through red states, blue states, even simply through the United States or internationals, China, Brazil. You and I, until we go to be with Jesus, we're walking through Emmanuel's ground. It belongs to my king. And I want everyone in it to belong to that king. And their faith, little or big, is in their God. And there is none like him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The earth is full of his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the moments we could be together. We rejoice as men and women purchased by the Lamb, our King Emmanuel. We thank you and praise you. Friend, this day, my simple invitation is if you're here and any other thing you put your trust in, it will not deliver you, it will devour you, it brings nothing but death, but there is a Savior. Your wife or your husband cannot save you. Marriage cannot save you. Children cannot save you. Your job cannot save you. But there is a Savior, and when He saves you, He'll send you to a spouse and to a children, not with the weight of them trying to be your Savior, but with you bring the weight of glory and grace to them because you have a Savior, Jesus. Please come to Him. There'll be people up here to my right and left. Just come and pray with them. Or today as a believer, you want to pray with someone. We invite you here. And we invite you to Jesus. Emmanuel. See him. Even inanimate objects like thresholds tremble in his presence. We tremble yet with joy for this Emmanuel has defeated not just kings of Ephraim and Syria, but has defeated all of our enemies. We have life in him. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.